Welcome to the Novel Discourse Podcast, where we discuss great stories and how they're told. We have a very fun episode today. We're going to be discussing the best movies of the 90s, in particular, the best screenplays of the 90s. And helping me do so today, we have Andy coming from Austin. Andy, how you doing? Pretty good, Sam. Uh, very excited about this. I consider myself an expert in uh, cinema from the 1890s, so I have prepared uh, <laughs> vehemently for this. Uh, all three films I have watched back to back. So great, good to hear. And then we've got uh, and we've got Webb uh, calling in for the first time. Webb, how are you doing? Doing well. Glad to be here. Thank you all for, uh, for inviting me. I'm definitely excited to talk about probably. Uh, my favorite time period in cinema history, which is just that era we grew up in, the, the 90s. You can't beat it. And as we discuss this, we're going to be doing a snake draft. So uh, if, you, if you've ever been in fantasy football, you're probably very familiar with this. But we're each going to be selecting our, our top five movies. We're each going to have a chance to uh, make a team, if you will. And then by the end, you'll you'll have a chance to figure out you know, which, which one of us drafted the best team. So, Webb, you talked about it a little bit. The 90s is just chock full of great movies. When I was making my my Mel Kiper big board for the 90s, there's just a ton of them. And and uh, it's it's hard to kind of whittle it down to five picks, isn't hey, it? Hey, this is an era where we killed it in the Gulf War, we're invincible, and the movies kind of reflect that, I, I feel like. And so for me, I know like a lot of times I'm just going to bed at night, always turn on like really bad 90s movies, you know, like bad action movies. That's where my head tends to go. But when I sat down and started to really look at, um, you know, movies, some of the screenplays from the 90s and some of the better movies we talked about, I got really excited about it because uh, there was some great films that came out during that 10-year stretch. And a lot of them are kind of really reflective, I think, of where the culture was at the time. And it's always fun to look back and put that under the microscope. It was like peak Americana, wasn't it? I mean, you brought that up. Um, some of these films, as I was going down the list of not only the ones that I put on my big board, but the ones that we'll probably talk about in honorable mentions, is like, you don't even have to know that a movie came out in the 90s. You could just be like, skimming past your cable, and you're like, this looks like a 90s film. It feels like a 90s film. Not only from the way they're directing it and the, and the way that the, the, the uh, kind of cinematography is going, but just the... Like you said, the themes and the way that the characters are presented and stuff. It's not quite the 80s, but it's a, it's a little more advanced than that. Not The hair's not quite as big. Extremely American-centric and just kind of feels big. Yeah, and it, I mean, it was, this is right before what, you know, where we are now with the worldwide box office, before we had such an emphasis on that. So you really do get a lot of, like, what would be good, we'll call them Oscar movies, you know, you think of between the 70s and the 90s of uh, stories that really hit home. Uh, growing up here in the United States, you know, where we're all basically that was the entire market coming out of Hollywood for the most part. Um, movies that are really original that don't get made a lot anymore when we just kind of got more and more like CGI heavy Marvel movies, movies with The Rock and stuff. Uh, I miss some of the stuff that I'm sure we'll talk about today, uh, like Goodwill Hunting. Um, you know, movies like that. Hey, don't give away my first yeah, overall right. pick. A, Come on, a lot more uh, original, a lot more original screenplays yep. were made at the time. Uh, it's felt like way fewer sequels, reboots. I mean, the stuff that we're rebooting and sequeling now, a lot of it had its, its beginning of its era in, in the 1990s. Um, I think it's interesting you bring up kind of the like peak Americana. Um, I was actually going to draw a similar comparison. You know, early in the 90s was when uh, Francis Fukuyama published The End of History, which was kind of this landmark socio-political doctrine about how now that communism has like been vanquished, uh, liberal democracy is the final form of government. Like it, it, people truly believe that like we're done, like no more. Yeah. There will never be another big change. Society has reached its Frieza's final form. No need to get the Dragon Balls. We're good. Um, and I think our, our culture and our media reflected that, that it was like, let's explore what it's like to be at the top. Um, and I think so much of, if you look at movies set in all time periods, so many of those movies are set at the peak of various societies, civilizations. So like most movies about Rome are at the peak of the Roman Empire. Most movies about Great Britain are at the height of their imperial brilliance, um, things like that. And so I think movies in the 90s that were made about the, the contemporary period reflect what Americans considered. I mean, um, you know, I don't know if anyone's gonna choose The Matrix, but 
you know, there's a line in the matrix where they're like, yeah, we had to choose like what we were, the machines were going to make the matrix. And we decided to, to choose the end of the 20th century, the peak of human yeah. civilization, which is a very interesting in retrospect to like, think of like 1998 as this is as good as it's ever going to be like, man. And, and you, 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 something interesting you kind of bring up talking about the matrix. That's one of those movies. I hope we get the chance to talk about it. Comes out at the very end of the decade. And I went back just the other week and watched uh, Misery with Kathy Bates uh, and James Cameron. Super good. Like from like 1990. And it's amazing just on the technical front, like the cinematography and oh, everything, yeah. how much it's changed. If we go back and watch a film from 2008, you know, that is 12, 13 years old, whatever, right now, you can't really tell a difference, you know, in production versus like kind of what you're streaming on Netflix in 2022. When you look at the 90s and, and pick up a movie from like 1991, it feels totally different than the stuff that was coming out by the end of the decade. Um, I agree. I also feel like some of these movies hold up a little better because of their reliance on practical effects rather than CGI. Yep. Like, especially in the early 2000s when CGI came into prominence, like, of course, to them and to us, it looked great. But now we have such better CGI that they actually date themselves like pretty severely. Like I went back and was watching yeah. the old Star Wars prequels. And they look like shit. Yep. Like the CGI is really bad. The backgrounds don't blend well with like what's in the foreground. I, so you can instantly tell when these movies were made. Whereas like you watch Saving Private Ryan and you know, that could have been made anytime. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, or it's a modern Jurassic film, Park, obviously, dude. but yeah. There, how, Jurassic, how well Park looks Jurassic great. Park special effects hold up over time. And I compare that to, I remember when I was in sixth grade, like right after this decade, I think it was year 2000, 2001, Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire. I thought yeah. that was the coolest. The trailer alone, I was like, this is the, you know, special effects will never get any better than this. And I look back yeah. now, and it looks so cartoonish and dated. Even compared to, you know, Jurassic Park from 1993, that truly holds up better in terms of its special effects. It looks more real. And it, and it, than... it, it, it feels like it forced filmmakers. I mean, the big, the big uh, example of this is when, and this is not from the 90s, but when Steven Spielberg made Jaws, um, they couldn't show the shark that much because... Mm -hmm. It was an animatronic shark. It looked kind of shitty. And so they had to use kind of like the, the mystery of the shark, the presence of the shark, and the, the fear of the unknown and the ocean. Whereas now, if you made Jaws, dude, that, that shark's going through the boat. It's jumping in slow motion out of the water. Yeah, and and it you'd see the, the shark film. in the trailer if it came yeah, out now. Exactly. You'd see the shark exactly. in the trailer. Um, so and, I, I, I think there's a, a certain, a definite charm to these movies because of like the constraints they were under. And I think that forced innovation and creativity that maybe you don't see now because they are able to just like shoot for three weeks in front of a green screen and then just hand it off to the guys in post and have them, you know, avatar. I don't even know what those actors did. <laughs> like, yeah, not, have, like, like the entire film is just like entirely rendered. Not to sound totally, uh, apathetic or, or hopeless, you know, uh, but to, to kind of put on my, my boomer hat, I think that it is crazy, and you mentioned this earlier, how everything we have today, it seems like it's a sequel or some sort of reboot. I saw a really interesting chart a couple years back that showed uh, like the top grossing movies by decade, and they used three different colors, like red, yellow, and blue. Blue was like based off a book, you know, red was an original script, and yellow was some sort of sequel. Um, and Man, from the 70s through the 80s, it was like almost entirely original scripts or, or yeah. stuff based off books. In the 90s, a ton of that too. And then like right as you hit the millennium, the entire chart just went full on yellow. It was like everything and, and I don't was like, black too, Spider-Man too. I, I don't want to take credit away because there are great original, even big budget action. Like John Wick was amazing. Yeah. Like the Bourne movies came out. Those are based on books. But like there's there's stuff that has come out that is really good. But yeah, the, the, the percentage of existing ip um and the timeline for a reboot is so shortened now like uh, when i first saw oceans 11 when i was a kid i didn't even know there was an old oceans 11 that like frank sinatra yeah. was in because it had been so long now they're talking about rebooting american psycho and that came out when i was in like elementary school and now it's going to come out like in my early 30s that's that's a very short timeline to be yeah. like yeah let's just go ahead and reel this back out like well, I'm excited. I feel like Nick Young being on the the Warriors when he was like flexing that he got a ring, and people are like, "Wait, Nick Young was on the Warriors back then? Like, I thought he was on the Lakers." But like, here, you guys are just like perfectly dissecting it. And here I am, just like listening. Like, yep, I'm gonna be on this group project. 
Um, but speaking of sports references, um, something to keep in mind about this draft that we have tonight is that we have a little bit of a stipulation. And much like if you're watching the NBA draft and you'll see teams maybe take a center or a power forward um, after they've taken a point guard, we want to mix things up a little bit, right? It'd be very easy to sit there and just go draft a drama, 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 you know, yeah. best screenplay dramas across the board. In order to mix things up, we're going to add a stipulation, which is you have to draft at least three different genres. You have to pick, a, you know, maybe it's a romantic comedy, maybe it's an action flick, maybe it's a mystery thriller, but whatever it is, mix it up a little bit. Um, you'll be asked to have at least three different genres by the end of the draft. And and if, it, if there's ever a question as to whether or not a genre is one thing or another, we can always discuss that as part of the debate, right? So after everybody makes a pick, we are going to get into the discussion as to whether or not it was considered a reach or whether this is like a, you know, consensus all American that's going to kill it. Um, and Sam, is this, the, uh, uh, just so we're clear on the, uh, the framework here, is this mm -hmm. the best movies, our favorite movies? I think a lot of times when like lists of things come out, people yep. want to know what the methodology is. So I just want to make sure the listeners sure. know kind of what we're, where our heads are at with this. Yeah, my, my thought process, you know, this, this title is going to be the best screenplays of the 90s, but there are some screenplays that are phenomenal that everything else is poor, right? Absolutely. And so I think the best way of marking this is best movies with screenplay greatly in mind. Because there are some movies that we consider to be pretty pretty stellar that maybe the, the screenplay isn't the reason for that. You brought up last week, we talked about The Gladiator. I don't know if Gladiator is 90s film. It's Hopefully I'm not picking anybody's yeah. pick away. Got it. Okay, perfect. Like Gladiator excels for a lot of reasons, but I wouldn't consider screenplay one of them, right? So like, well, in some of these movies, movies, like I have movies on my list that are like mind. in my big board. I have movies that are uh, quintessentially '90s. Like you watch them, you instantly know they're '90s, but they're not. They wouldn't be on the bit. Like I have Hackers, which if someone was like explain, show me the '90s in a film, Hackers would definitely be in my top five because it's just like so perfect about that. But Again, not a great screenplay, horribly acted. Not a very good movie, but very 90s. Right. So I, think I just the, want to make sure the main thing the is, bounds. yeah, let's focus on the movies with the really strongest stories. You know, because uh, I, I did the same thing when I started looking at what movies I might actually want to pick in this draft. I, I started looking at some of the movies I love the most and said, man, this movie is really, like, it's extremely well directed. The acting's in it's great. Uh, but from a story perspective, it's, it's just good it's not great it wouldn't be like a top giving the 10. rock is like one of my favorite movies of all time right but i can't say it has like the greatest script no sure. one's gonna give you a hand you a pulitzer because you wrote the <laughs> because you wrote the rock right all right, right. Don't pick. so with that being said um we'll go ahead and get started um now that everybody understands the rules so again just keep in mind that you have to pick three different uh genres throughout your five picks so um i have drawn straws before this recording and Leading us off is going to be Andy. It's going to go Andy, myself, and then oh, Webb. Lord. Webb has the kind of privilege of having the third pick. And then again, because it's a snake draft, he'll get the fourth pick over as well. So, Andy, no fray. In, in a few picks, you'll be able to pick back to Man, back well. this but is tough. Go ahead, Andy. You have you have the kind of uh, the privilege and the punishment of picking the number one story of the 90s. So, so I thought about set. this a lot, actually, because there are – I mean – it goes without saying that in a decade of film, you're going to have some incredible power players. And there's some that are so uh, emotionally important to me that it was very difficult. Um, I'm really torn between two. Ooh. I think I'm going to say Goodfellas okay. as the number one Ooh. pick. Let's get into Goodfellas. I think, I think Goodfellas is the most perfect mafia movie that has ever been created. I think it's better than The Godfather or Part Two, which are both in my, you know, I love those movies. Um, Goodfellas is like the most perfect Scorsese film. Like if you only, could only show someone one Scorsese movie and be like, this is Scorsese, like Goodfellas is that movie. It has insane uh, performances by a bunch of actors. And I love the, the screenplay is incredible. Just like the kind of the what has become like a big trope which is kind of like the you've, you've seen it in things like um scarface just like the rise and fall of a, of a gangster and kind of watching how that world is built up and then crumbles and in this we get to see henry hill it, it 
encapsulates so much of his life, which on the surface, it almost seems like that'd be too much and you wouldn't be able to do that well in a tight, concise screenplay in a way that keeps the audience engaged. But every period of his life in this film is done really tightly, really great moments they use to capture the spirit of the era he's living in. Uh, you know what time period you're operating in based on how people are dressed and their conversation and the attitudes towards different things. Um, and it just has some of the most iconic dialogue like of any, oh, yeah. uh, of, of any mafia movie. So Goodfellas is my Did, number one pick. The, the thing about this movie that was sticking out to me, cause I had it number two on my big board. Um, this is the Doak Walker award winner from Penn state. Who's rushed for like 2000 yards. Yeah, like, definitely. <laughs> just like he solid ass pick that nobody's going to question. Right. Yep. Um, Goodfellas has, first of all, it's like, even if you don't know what Goodfellas is, you know what Joe Pesci's character from Goodfellas Absolutely. was. Absolutely. Right? This is what that character and was you, created. Hey, yeah. he won, won an Oscar for Best Sporting Actor um, for that. And I was trying to see, I think this movie actually got beat out in Best Picture or for Best Screenplay when it came out by uh, Dances with Wolves. Which it I actually did. It was a big, it, people said it was a big snub. Like, yeah, but, exactly. Which, Dances with Wolves is great. Um, not as good as Goodfellas. In but fact, it's not I Goodfellas. went when I because I had Dances with Wolves. I don't want to get on a Dances with Wolves tangent. I actually would kind of like to, but I'm not going to pick it for a number of reasons. <laughs> Once I started looking at it more closely, I was like, man, there is no way this is better than Goodfellas. Uh, it's right. it's on many levels way more campy. Goodfellas, I will say this: um, it is Martin Scorsese's is at his finest as a director. Yeah, it is like, masterpiece. The script is good. I think it's worthy of definitely being a top ten or a top five from the '90s. But as far as like directorial effort goes, it's no doubt that it is a top five. I love the pace of it. It locks you in from kind of this, uh, you know, the first line of the movie, all I ever wanted to do was be a gangster. Yeah, for um, as long as I can remember, right. I wanted to be a gangster. And it, what it does that I think is really interesting, because before Goodfellas, you know, and to this day, kind of the uh, status symbol or the status quo for mafia movies is The Godfather. And The Godfather yeah, presents this really sexy underworld of these, you know, people who kind of- Kind of gentlemen, like gen gentlemen yes. criminals who like, yep. have a code. But this, what this does is it, it feels a lot more real is it locks you in with Henry Hill's sense of, you know, uh, boyhood wonder, just watching these guys from across the street. And then it locks you into the sex and you see the fast paced lifestyle. But unlike The Godfather, it, it, it both kind of highlights the machismo of these guys and also like cuts them down at the same time for, being, oh, yeah. you know, uh, for, for all their shortcomings and how everything kind of unravel so you get a great juxtaposition that i don't think coppola really gives you with the godfather um agreed and it said i think this sets up the sopranos like that whole idea. i was gonna i was just gonna bring up that like i think that we've almost i think goodfellas and the sopranos almost ruined the mafia genre for anyone who wanted to try it afterward because they brought such a level of gritty realism and a different perspective to the genre and after that you could never go back and just make the like I'm going to make you an offer you couldn't refuse them yep. ever again because it seemed like fake after yep. you saw the good, like Goodfellas and the Sopranos. So, yeah, agreed totally. I still love that scene where they I have the guy in the trunk and they stop over it. Is it Joe Pesci's mom's house? So good. Yeah. yeah he's like, mom, she's like yeah, this nice little Italian house, lady yeah. making food. This knife. And I love that where he's looking at the painting and he goes, I like this painting. You know, one dog faces one way, one dog faces the other. Hey, that kind of looks like <laughs> someone we know. And they all just start, they all just start <laughs> laughing. Dude, oh, I, my, right from the start, it gets me because I love the scene where he get Henry gets in trouble for skipping school. And then it immediately cuts to like him in the backseat of the car with all the mob guys. And the mailman comes out of the post office and you just see Henry. He'll go, that's him. And they just <laughs> kidnap the postman and they're shoving his head in a pizza oven being like, you ever bring this, any mail to this fucking kid's house again? I'm going to fucking cook you alive. You understand me? Like, <laughs> Instantly, you're like, holy yes. shit, dude. I mean, I will say this about Goodfellas. How many times have you seen that movie? How many times have you sat down intentionally to watch it? And how many times have you just seen it on TV and the next thing you know, oh, you're like in for like You're two done, minutes. yeah. Like, well, absolutely. I know the shoebox scene is coming up in 15 minutes. There's no way I'm, I'm going to yeah. get up now. Go home and get your fucking shine I, we, box. We haven't talked about it, but I still think my favorite scene is it's not even intentional, but it's a scene towards the beginning where they're in the bar and 
the the kind of penultimate scene part of the scene is when Joe Pesci gets mad at the guy for laughing too hard at his story or yeah. whatever. That's kind of like what I'm a clown to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like, what I love it for is the meme ability of Ray Liotta's laughing. In that oh yeah, scene, you yeah. Know? His laugh. I, I, as a kid, that was like the one thing that stuck out to me is just like watching him laugh. It has nothing to do with the screenplay, but God, I, it's I, like, know, it, I was just gonna it's say, got several. It's, this movie just has several scenes that you can just that are just speech for themselves, if you will. Well, and like I know it's not screenplay, but I have to bring up, dude. How about the tracking shot where they get out of the car? He's no. taking his wife on their first date, and the camera just follows them like side entrance down that long hallway. Henry's saying hi to everyone. He's tipping everybody. He's the man. Yep. They snap their fingers. They bring out like they don't have a table. It's totally full, so they bring out a separate table, and you're kind of like you're almost another person walking mm -hmm. with him, and you're just like, "Damn, dude, this guy is the man." And the second they sit down, like the bottle of champagne just appears, and he looks over, and there's like a huge table full of just three hundred pound fat Italian guys that are like, "Hey, salut!" Like so yeah. good, dude. I mean, it's like one of the. It's a shot that's been recreated in a uh, thousand movies since, but. And there's so much detail yeah, in like every every shot of that movie that Scorsese put in. And another thing that you mentioned, I forget what song's playing when they do that tracking shot, but like all Scorsese movies, really? he spends like a gajillion dollars buying the dollars. Yeah. All these like Rolling Stone. The, the the music changes, you know, through the decades as you follow Henry Hill. The scores, the music they have in there. How about great. Henry Hill taking a taking a revolver and going across the street and just oh, pistol whipping homeboy to like half to death in his driveway, telling him if you ever touch her again, I'll kill you. Then he just walks over this girl he's been on two dates with and puts a bloody revolver in her hand and goes hide this, and she goes, I'm not gonna lie, it turned me on. You yep. like, oh, shit, <laughs> well, dude, in that whole what? scene where she's hey, down, hey, hey, we, you know, like she's got the gun yeah. right there, and it's her oh. choice not to, you know, it's like. From a character standpoint, that's her choice. And then her at the apartment, banging, like hitting all the buttons, being like, "To ah, Rossi, you're a whore, landlord. You have a whore living here." Like so classic, dude. She kills all right. you, man. That's so. We have to move on to this. Bitch. I know. I'm sorry. Hey, We're like 25 minutes into this pod. Great, great that, choice. Yeah. So that's why it's yeah, number we, one. We, I mean, we're gonna do we're gonna do a uh, a a, a good fellas pod, I'm sure, eventually, but. uh we need to move on to my pick because it's all about me. <laughs> um, so the n my my pick is going to be, um, you know, this could be construed as probably like a best movie and maybe not best screenplay, but I'm going to go ahead and pick it because it's there. And Webb probably knows because I've talked about this multiple times. This, this is kind of my go-to favorite movie of all time, or at least it's been for most of my life, and that's Forrest Gump. Oh, Great number pick. two overall. Great pick. Um, so Forrest Gump, let's get started with it. Um, I think to me, this story is all about the characters. Definitely. Um, it is, it, I think what is fascinating about Forrest Gump is that it is extremely character driven for a character who is, who in no way, shape or form should be relatable because he is a, like he's mentally challenged, but he's also wildly athletic and he just kind of falls under these circumstances, but yet we somehow relate to him really well, and we, we, we kind of attach ourselves to him. Um, I also think Loki, it has one of the best, I don't want to say antagonist, but maybe fake allies in film, which is Ginny. I mean, I know oh, there's a lot of memes about Ginny being just... She is the yeah, worst. Yeah, she is the worst. Um, but it's that, like, Ginny. Forrest Gump just is all about hope, like what's going to come next, and Ginny is kind of the ultimate hope in that story. Yeah. What, when is Forrest going to eventually get with her? What's that going to look like? That's kind of what you think throughout the entire story. But the script has more to... It, there, there's more out there for Forrest than, than just that, right? And it's just... it's. I love stories that are both meandering, but... Like, that are meandering, but that keep you engaged, right? There's a few other scripts that are, that are like that on here that I don't want to give away because some of them might be my picks, but... Anytime that a story can have not just like A plot, B plot, and then resolution, anytime they can just kind of be this seamless flow of a movie one I thing led to another, to but it's engaging is, uh... for two hours, like you get bonus points for that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's paced incredibly well. There's so many good characters. I mean, Lieutenant Dan, obviously. Um, Lieutenant Bubba, Dan has magical legs. Obviously, lives. incredible character. Yeah. What, what was that? Lieutenant Dan has magical legs. You know what movie I yeah, compare like, it to a lot is uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? 
which I've always felt yeah. is like similarly yes. charming and kind of fanciful, magical, and yeah. again, very meandering. Like you can't really tell. They don't really go that far in that movie. Like it's kind of an A to B that like, you know, a couple days long, but it's just like a, a lovely little small town tale. And that's kind of what Forrest Gump is too. Um, and I love, I think while people may not identify with him, I think they aspire to his level of like innocence and like naivete, yep. like almost a positive naivete. Um, I love the, uh, he talked me into investing in some fruit company called Apple and we did pretty well. Yeah. Like just yep. things like that. You're just like, oh man, what a good guy. <laughs> like what, It didn't change him. Like, I, it's I so think, good. I think the number one thing about this film that I can't, I can't say quite as strongly about other films on my big board is Forrest Gump is the one film of my top 10 that is, is so well written, but there's no heaviness to it. And it's to the point where I can show Forrest Gump to literally any audience. Yeah. I can show it to like my future children. I could show it to like in-laws, whoever. It doesn't matter who the audience is. There are other films on this list. Like, let's be honest, like Shawshank Redemption or whatever. We're like, there's some people that are not going to get it and it might not resonate with them. But Forrest Gump kind of straddles the line between like great drama, comedy, and just telling a really interesting story with a really strong protagonist that is super rare in all forms of storytelling. So, you know, to use a sports analogy, Forrest Gump is like, I just took the boring center from Notre Dame that like, nobody's going to be like, wow, really excited about that. But like, Dude, you can't argue about it. Yeah, it's just super solid. It's just so flawless sure. from start to finish. Yeah, definitely. The beginning of a big, beautiful relationship between Tom Hanks and I think Robert Zemeckis directed it. Tom Hanks uh, is going to be on this list a couple times. I yeah, have a, a and that's, that's side note. That's another movie with a great soundtrack too that I'm sure they spent. Oh, like, definitely. A ton of money Absolutely. On. And, and, and side note, I didn't realize until I was doing um, some studying up for this pod that uh, Robin Wright the who plays Ginny. Yeah. I didn't realize that the actress that plays Ginny is the same actress that plays Frank Underwood's wife on, whose name is escaping me on. No uh, way. House, House of Cards. Cards. Yeah, Robin wow. Wright's been a lot of yeah, I had no idea, Penn. dude. Was for a while. Ugh. Yeah. Sean, Sean Penn's <laughs> yeah, ex-wife. Okay. I, I, uh, so Webb, uh, with all that being said, give us your, uh, your, the number three overall pick, what you got? This is the number three overall pick. In my number one pick, my first round draft spot, gentlemen, I'm going to go with Silence of the Lambs. Ooh, nice. Yes. The first great horror choice. movie. Yep. And, it, and you know what? Yeah, I, that, that's all I was about to say. It's, that's, a great, that's a great reason to pick it so early is because it's it's in a genre where maybe it's a little bit weaker. So good job, Wes. So I, uh, I love this movie. I actually went back and watched it this weekend once I realized that I wanted this to kind of be my – first round pick um this movie was uh the first and only horror film ever to win what they call the big five at the oscars which means it won best picture best director best actor best actress and best screenplay there's only two other nice. movies in the history of cinema that have ever done that it happened one night from 1934 and one flew over the cuckoo's nest from like mid 70s um this Going back and rewatching it, one, I will just say in general, this movie is extremely dark. Um, I'd kind of forgotten yeah. just how not only like violent it is, but man, there is some stuff uh, in that movie that it is just like, man, I, it, this would be so raw, kind of, even if it came out today. Um, Definitely. But that's neither here nor dude, the there. Guy, the guy throwing cum on her yeah, that's a, that's exactly jail cell? Yeah. That's fucking rough, dude. I totally like forgot any time about period. <laughs> well, he, he, she walks by and he says that he can smell her, you know, woman parts. It's like, I could, you yeah. know, way back he does that. And, and I mean, that's all in like the first five minutes. But this is a great story, uh, to, you know, top to bottom. I think that they do a great job setting up this character, Hannibal Lecter, who is definitely a fake opponent ally. He appears to be an antagonist towards Clarice, but he's really, you know, helping her find Buffalo Bill and likes her. It's very similar to how like, yeah. Snape works in the Harry Potter series. Sure. Um, and they do uh, the, the build up from the beginning of this movie just to like, she's going to meet Hannibal Lecter. There's great build up. She like goes down to the jail cell and it's all dark and the guards like talking to her about this guy. And he's like, yeah, you know, he, he killed this guy and his, the, 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 uh, Police said that his pulse never went above 85, even when he ate her tongue. And it's just, it's <laughs> so like, scary, dude, it's dude. so freaky. And 
I, overall, I just think it does a great job um, kind of handling its themes. It's obviously terrifying. This was a movie that was based off a book. It was actually, I think the book, for The Silence of the Lambs, was a sequel to Red Dragon, which became yeah. kind of like a yep. prequel that they released later. It's not cheap like a lot of other horror was in the 90s. Like, you look at other big-name horror movies that came out in the 90s, like Scream, where they went super meta and, like, kind of made a mockery because horror was so huge in the 80s. They felt like they had nowhere to go. And then you get, like, the Blair Witch Project, which kind of created this new genre of, like, the found footage, you know, uh, paranormal activity is kind of in that same vein. Um, and so this was, like, a really heavy-hitting not not jump scares not is way more on the psychological side and it's done so well and obviously it's got tentpole performances from both uh clary starling and hannibal lecter um but i totally agree man it's like well, i i actually am a bit not a horror person i, I don't enjoy being scared that much yeah um but silence of the lambs is easily one of the best horror movies i've ever seen like, they do a great job of of ratcheting up the tensions you know as things go on clary shows up she first meets hannibal lecter she sees that he's got this he's got all these drawings all over his cell and one of them is of uh this you know the city of florence that he's drawn completely from memory and he's like all i have left is my memories now and his whole thing is he's going to try to get her to to kind of meet his end goals which is he wants to get out of this baltimore state hospital um and go somewhere that has a has a view where you can see some trees maybe see the sky um, at least that's what he says. And as the story goes on, obviously you find out more about the Clarice character. And Lecter's got her pinned from the jump. Like as soon as he meets oh, her, yeah. he kind of uh, you know talks down to her about the way she's dressed. She's wearing these cheap shoes and stuff. And by the way, there's a huge element of uh, misogyny and sexism that is built oh, into this. When I went back and watched it, a little bit of it felt, uh, I think, looking back 30 years in the future... Some of it feels a little overhanded, you know, like Clary shows up to the Baltimore State Hospital and she's like immediately getting hit on um, by, the, by the guy that works there. But at the same time, a lot of it's really nuanced um, and come to find out this whole backstory that she has of her parents died early. She had to go live at this farm in Montana. And one night she just heard when they were killing all the lambs, she heard them screaming and like she tried to save one of them, but couldn't. And then her uncle like found her and like killed that lamb and then booted her to go live in an orphanage. So, like, her whole character is, you know, trying to... And, and the, what Lecter asks her, which, by the way, when he sees her near the end of the film, he's eating his second dinner that night, and he orders lamb medium rare. And he goes, do you think if you catch Buffalo Bill and save this girl that the screaming will stop? Thus the name Silence of the Lambs. And Dude. it just... It, dude, it's so... How about yeah. when you first see Lecter, yeah. where she's walking down the hallway, <sighs> and you see the plexiglass cell, you instantly know it's, like, different than the other cells, and as she walks, and the, the frame of reference, like, widens, you just see him standing, like, perfect posture, smiling, like, with his head <sighs> already, like, zeroed at her, and he's just like... And then the iconic, the, hello, Clarice. He's oh, just like, He said, man. I heard, I actually read something where he said something about his voice. He actually went, uh... What did he say? I wrote this down. He he tried to sound like a mix between Truman Capote and Catherine Hepburn. That's what a a Anthony Hopkins was wow. going for. I can kind of hear that now that I think about it. Like definitely the Capote side of things makes a ton of sense. He has that weird inflection of like yeah. high high sounds in the back of your throat, and then Audrey Hepburn with like that very enunciated like round vowels. Like no, that's very cool, man. And it it is just uh, overall like the Buffalo Bill character is obviously creepy as hell. You go back, you can. We could dissect that character you nine me? ways from Sunways. Yeah, I'd fuck like, me. <laughs> people thought, uh, I read that like some of the critics of this film in years since have said, well, like, hey, this is an attack on um, like transgenderism. Like and transgender the, films, the writer has come back and was like, dude, this guy, and Lecter even says this, it's like, he's not a transgender. He is so disturbed that his only, like, he's trying to become farthest away from what he is as possible Just the right? opposite like, of what he exactly. is yeah exactly and so he goes down this crazy wormhole and obviously like keeping the girl in that pit and she's he's trying to starve her to loosen up her skin and so oh, i mean dude. It, it, dude it is so disturbing in that last scene uh where she's in the house and he cuts the lights out and you're seeing everything from his night vision and she's like right in front of him just like oh, terrified God. is the freakiest uh 
you know, he's like, he has her hand like right in front of his face and you can just like see that she feels him right by there. It's not till he does the safety on his gun that she just like turns around and boom. Blast blasts him. him. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The only thing I'll add here is that we had somebody on Twitter pose the question if, would you rather have a story with a boring protagonist or a, por a boring villain? And I think this movie is a perfect example of a strong villain can completely create a, you can create a story out of thin air with a strong villain, right? Because in theory, a villain is what creates the plot, right? They create the problem that then becomes the entire plot of the, of the story. And, you know, Webb, you, you talked about Hannibal Lecter's character being a, a fake ally, but let's just calling him for a villain for a second, because that's what he kind of represents for most of the film. What a strong villain to base your story off of. Like, yep. It's, I mean, that, that can carry so much of the screenplay and so much of the movie, just him alone. The rest of the movie could be subpar, which it's not, but if it was, you could just have Hannibal Lecter and it would be a, well, that, a really And I think he's, story. he's uniquely disturbing to people because we make, I think in general, people comfort themselves with the idea that they could spot a monster from far off that mm -hmm. they're, they're they're like buffalo bill they're weird they live in a dank cave of a house they got long stringy hair they can barely put a sentence together they've got shifty <laughs> eyes so to see someone who is like cultured articulate charismatic like sociopathic enough to engage you in conversation and be incredibly warm when they want to be and like reel you in and yet be so monstrous that they would like bite your tongue out of your mouth is uniquely terrifying to people who pride yep. themselves on the ability to like recognize evil when it's up close and yep. they might not be able to with a guy like Lecter. And I think that, uh, For sure. fake, all right, let me, let well, me just do a couple touch points on this real quick. Cause I did want to just point out that like that fake opponent ally that Hannibal Lecter plays is it's a lot more rare because it doesn't, those type of characters don't give opposition for you to like, develop your protagonist against you know it's much more common to have yeah. a fake ally opponent to to help build your story so this was a beautiful use of that um we could talk about it for a while but we'll keep moving i know we don't want to spend the whole time talking about silence of the lambs that's my first well, one you're, you're you got your next one too you yeah. also have the fourth pick okay so for fourth pick and now that it falls upon me um you know i'm second guessing myself just like we do in these drafts I'm going to have to go, I'm going to do Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Good choice. Very nice. Yep. So I believe that this movie won, if I think it won Best Picture probably. Um, yep. Un Best Picture in 1992. I don't think it won for the script alone, but it is, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it is definitely kind of a riff on... <laughs> Clint Eastwood's entire, you know, career from his early days in Hollywood and takes on the issue of, you know, violence and does violence beget violence. It's, it's definitely a commentary on movie violence. The whole film is, um, and for those that haven't seen it, Clint Eastwood plays this guy. I think his name's William Mundy. He used to be a killer, roamed the West, you know, hired hand, uh, and, and, and then he got married and settled down, but his wife died and he's like an unsuccessful, you know, he's tried to do a pig farm and live this normal life and it just hadn't panned out. And what happens in the beginning of the movie is that you have this uh, local sheriff is played by Gene Hackman. He goes, he's a character named Little Bill. And there's an incident one night at a whorehouse in this small Western town where they uh, deface, like actually cut up one of the prostitutes. So these women get together and they basically put out, um, contract for someone to come in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so that's when Clint Eastwood kind of rolls into town. But throughout the whole movie, you really see like how violence is just one. It's not, it, it never really feels like justification. For example, like there is a uh, character who is named English Bill or something who comes into town to take on Gene Hackman. And when Gene Hackman finally, you know, uh, kills this guy or kicks his ass in front of everyone in town. It's like not a gratifying experience for the audience. In fact, it like, there's a shot each, each time Gene Hackman like hits this guy, it cuts to some of the townspeople, you know, and they're looking horrified. There's another character named the Schofield kid who wants to be just like Clint Eastwood. You know, he's really eager to like go out and, and, and kill people and, and make a name for himself. 
And uh, when he actually does it, he goes to the outhouse and ends up shooting this guy. It like messes him, him up, you know, like he does not have the stomach for it. And what's interesting about this is that the film is not, while that's kind of the theme, uh, I think that what it does really well is that it's definitely not overhanded in any way. The film is not set out as like some diatribe for like, hey, violence doesn't beget violence and this isn't bad. In fact, the way that the film ends is, you know, Clint Eastwood is very upfront about like, dude, this stuff that happened in my former life is, it's not the stuff of romantic dime store novels that, you know, you read about in the old West. Like it's a lot of, and it's not even bravery. It's like dumb luck and cowardice half the time. Yeah. But yet at the end of the movie, instead of having like any sort of, uh, you know, instead of ha- completing that character arc totally, it just descends right back into immortality. Like Clint Eastwood comes back after they kills his friend in one of the best ending scenes of any movie of all time. He comes into uh, the saloon where Gene Hackman is and he's got a double barrel shotgun with him and he just cranks it and everyone stops. And there's this guy standing there and he goes, move it, fat man. And this guy moves out of the way. And Gene Hackman, you know, tells me, he goes, I know your type. You know, I've guy like you, you've killed women and children. And Clint Eastwood just goes, Ugh. he's like, yeah, I reckon I've killed just, I've killed women and children. I reckon I've killed just about everything that's walked or crawled at some point. And now I'm here to kill you, little Bill. And it is just, and then like thunder, boom, like strikes and it, literally gives you goosebumps every time you watch it. Um, so I think That's awesome. it's one of Clint Eastwood's finest movies. Um, and it's one of the best of the nineties. So second, it's got stick. a top tier Western town name of uh, big whiskey, Wyoming. I forgot just about like that. Amazing oh, yeah. name for a Western town. Yeah. Like yeah. exclusively gunfighters hang out in big whiskey, yes. Wyoming. <laughs> like, no, it's good. It's, it's no, I just, you know, I think that, uh, Unforgiven is one of the best of the nineties. I'm going to roll with that for my second pick. Um, I think it's one of Clint Eastwood's finest pieces of work and it's interesting how it kind of challenges the mythology behind, you know, the character he played for most of his career. Um, it was a movie that came out and cl- people were like, man, Clint Eastwood isn't just like a, you know, great anti-hero leading man. Like this guy is a truly good filmmaker, which we've seen. Sure. Couple times since then, and and Gene Hackman like it launched his like uh, kind of a period of him playing like the the Dude, big bad. He was in everything. Um, what was the what was the other movie where it's like a western town that Gene Hackman runs and everyone has to gunfight him? You know what I'm talking oh, about? Yep, the Quick and the Dead. That the Cap- Quick and the Dead. Aaron Stone, Stone the Russell Crowe, Leo DiCaprio. So good, thing was, dude. So yeah. good. I mean, this, way more campy and ridiculous. Yeah, like yeah. way, way, way more. But like another just like. They pretty much definitely went to Gene Hackman and they were like, you remember Unforgiven? Okay, same thing. You yep. just <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this, <laughs> you got to think, again. like, Hollywood was built on the Western, which eventually turned into the action yeah. movies because Western Because, I mean, the, the budget things. you needed, like, the, the production of a Western was so much easier than anything yep. else. Like, the sets were easier to build. They, it, they could take them out in the desert and you're there. That's actually where it happened. Yep. So that's easy. Like, But yeah, we, for sure. we did Westerns for 50 years and Unforgiven was, like, the first movie that really came out and there was nothing... They weren't trying to make this sexy. It challenged everything that that we had just had kind of come to assume about the Western. Good versus you could make evil a you could make like a case that like the lineage of like the more gritty Western, like the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Unforgiven, and then more modern ones like True Grit, to a degree Django, but that's like a lot got a lot more comedy. In the, it. the remake of True Grit, yeah, yeah the remake of True Grit, better than the original, and then it's uh, like the exact same even thing. like wet and even like uh, neo Western, like Western noir, like. Um, Hell or High Water mm. or Wind River. Um, I think that those Ooh, are all kind of descended from that same lineage of like this this more honest look at what like life on the edge of civilization is like. Um, and they're and they're always really great. I mean, I love all those movies I just named. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's it. That's my that's my second pick. I guess we'll throw this back to Sam now. Yeah. Um, so for my for my second pick, you know. One, one thing that's interesting about the 90s is there's so many good, heavy-hitting dramas. And, it, it, again, I use the sports kind of analogy. It's like I, I want a wide receiver in this draft, but there's like 10 really good wide receivers. But there's only a handful. There's certain genres there's only a handful of really, really good screenplays. Um, so I'm going to pick where there's some scarcity. Is I'm going to move a little bit further down in my board 
and grab for my second pick, Saving Private Ryan. Mm. Awesome movie. I think almost was my number one. Yeah, very like difficult that, for me not to make this go number one. Yeah, it's I, that good. It's like my favorite movie of all time. So it was. Uh, I was debating putting it on this list uh, for the top five, but I I've got your back on this because I. Do you remember like the just, first time you saw Saving Private Ryan? Yes, it was. No, awesome. but it, but man, is it was it like? I mean, it's one of those movies. I, I talked about how earlier. Forrest Gump is a movie that I could show everybody. Saving Private Ryan is a movie that I would be excited to show yeah, certain people. Absolutely. Um, I was thinking about earlier about like Saving Private Ryan is obviously a phenomenal movie, but the question is, is it a good screenplay? And the answer is an obvious yes. Yeah. If you start digging through it, I do think that it's a better movie than screenplay because yeah. Spielberg just like well, the action set dude. pieces yeah. are such a huge I mean, piece of the changed. equation that that's hard yes. to yeah. overcome, but. It's the beginning of But realism. here's the deal about this about this screenplay is like anybody can make an action uh, not anybody but an action movie can have wild awesome incredible action but not have the plot that Saving Private Ryan did. Yeah. I'm thinking a little bit about the movie uh the Lone Survivor movie had really good action yeah. but I don't think it's going to be remembered in 20 years because Saving Private Ryan with the storyline of like saving the brother you know, the, the last surviving brother, they have to go find him, I think is an incredibly gripping plot that you don't, you don't normally see war movies with that incredibly gripping plot from, from the beginning. I think the scene where they go visit the mother at the beginning and tell her, you know, basically that, that her third child has died yeah. is, is just like one of the most touching scenes. she gets any, all three letters of plots, uh, isn't that it? Yeah. She gets, they yeah. tell her like all, they, really? they're like, okay. hey, you're like, you got one left. And yeah. you had the, more of like. The, the scene, she's washing wow. the dishes. And she looks out yep. the, the farmhouse window and that car that she's clearly dreaded Ugh. for the entire time her son's been out there is coming down the road. She opens the front door and the army officer gets out and she's just like, okay. And then the chaplain gets out and, and she, she just calls yeah. onto oh. the porch. Dude, the whole movie is just, oh, it. I mean, I, I'll say this. The first time I saw this film, I was probably 10 years old and they used to, I don't know if they still do this, but when cable television like ruled the world, Every year on Memorial Day, they would show Saving Private Ryan with no commercials. Yeah, and like uh, unedited. Un unedited, yeah. Full yeah. unedited on TV. And I remember my dad uh, calling me downstairs in our house in Allen on, on Waters Crossing and telling me like, okay, like we're going to watch this movie. And I had not seen like any rated R movies at the time. And he was like, it's rated R, but this is a very important movie. And I was like, whoa, like my dad normally doesn't say like that about yeah. a movie. And dude, then the D-Day scene happens, and I've never seen anything like that. Like, no. I wasn't a sheltered kid, but like, there weren't that many movies with like dudes with their intestines hanging out coming no. out. And this wasn't right. like a gory, you know, kind of cartoony thing. This was an army of the uh, army of darkness. This was like some real shit. Um, I think as an adult, the thing that hits me so hard is that it is so difficult to write a character that people simultaneously identify with and hate. And Saving Private Ryan is one of these movies where the corporal, the, the you know, I can't remember his name, but the guy that's like a scared motherfucker that lets yeah, the guy, the guy who, caused, who directly causes his comrade <laughs> exactly. to die with the whole stabbing I, scene, yeah. To a, to a man, almost every American male that I have ever talked to about this agrees with me that like the reason you hate that guy so much is because – Deep down, everyone who has not served carries this deep fear that you would be that guy. That like, so you, without, without unless you have tested yourself in the fire of war, you have no real concept of how you would react. And so, in in everyone, there is a degree of like fear. And so, you could be the guy that's at the bottom of the stairs, gripping your helmet and crying as the dude that just bayoneted your homie to death walks by you, kind of laughing at you. And that is that's yeah. powerful filmmaking, dude. And Spielberg yeah, yeah, did such other... great like Easter eggs in this film. Um, this is the last piece I'll talk about, and I'll hand it off to you. But like the on D Day, they come up over the the ridge, and there's a slit trench with some Nazis in it, and they come up with their hands up, and they're they're yelling in what the the soldiers think is German, and they put their hands up, and they just blow them away anyway. And they're like, "Oh, what were they saying?" And the joke is, he's like, "Oh, he said, look, I washed for supper. If you turn on subtitles." They are speaking in Czech, not German, and it says, 
we're not we're not Nazis, we're not Germans, we're Czech, we were forced to fight, like please don't kill us. And you're just like suddenly in that moment, because you too are without the subtitle, you too are in the same position as the American soldiers, where you're just like right there with them, like, yeah, fuck these guys, like smoke these dudes, dude. They're evil, they're the Nazis, let's go. And then only afterward in your like second or third viewing or whatever, when you watch it with subtitles, you're suddenly aware of like, dude, this is what war does to humans, is it turns you into this like bloodthirsty version of yourself where you're like a hundred percent down to shoot someone who's unarmed and surrendering like it's crazy it's yeah. an incredible film it's, it's a masterpiece yeah the, the the other thing i want to add real quick is you talked about the d-day scene you know we talk about how great these action scenes are and they are incredible it, it, it shouldn't be lost that the screenplay in those scenes is phenomenal because the dialogue is super realistic the things that these characters are saying in the heart of the action is obviously incredible I, I don't even I almost don't even want to get into some of the details about like what some of the characters are saying after they get hit, you know, yeah. and as they're kind of Crying like for their moms last stuff. moments, that's it's incredibly rough. powerful. And the other thing I want to hit on is Tom Hanks's character kind of devolving throughout the film. Um being ready to go into war during D Day, and then you see him freeze up on the beach, and then by the end of the film, there's a scene where um I think in the last scene he's just standing there kind of waiting for the next thing to happen. All of a sudden he looks down and his hand is shaking. Yeah. Right. And just like little things like that is it's the nuances I think of this film that make it so incredible of it being such a character driven piece. So many of those things could be lost in every war movie. I mean, I think about a movie like, you know, we talk about action in a war movie. What, what's the movie with Tom, uh, Tom Cruise called called tomorrow war. Or Edge of war tomorrow. Of tomorrow or also whatever. slaps though. Great movie slaps but also like it's kind of the antithesis of this as far as a war movie oh, where sure. it's like sci-fi cool like... plot cool action but like characters flat dialogue flat there's no depth to it and well and like people are getting like this... torn in half by aliens and no one cares whereas like in Saving Private Ryan someone gets like shot in the arm and people are just like the gravity of that is so much heavier than like yeah. the most violent death in a more crazy movie i think the only other yeah. war movie i've seen like saving private ryan is probably the thin red line which also yeah. came out in the 90s but yep. similarly heavy about its treatment of war as like not something to be made light of or to be uh held up as like some beyond like some higher virtue but like a grim reality of living in the modern world Yep, there are some similarities that we yep. can definitely make between Unforgiven and Saving Private Ryan. I, I will Agreed. just say as a last note, and I know this doesn't uh, particularly relate to the story, but like I said, Saving Private Ryan is one of my top favorite movies. If we were just doing a list of like, hey, what were the best movies of the 90s? Saving Private Ryan, maybe it's my personal number one. Uh, and one thing that you cannot take away from Spielberg here is that, man, you watch any war movie, and arguably, even any action movie, pre-Saving Private Ryan, I mean, look at Platoon or anything that came out before, yeah. and then look at everything that came out after, whether it's Black Hawk Down or Lone Survivor or even like... Or 1914 or, or 1917. Yeah, the whole emphasis like... became realism, because when yeah, and veterans the were allowed camera, to the private screening, dirt and they were like, the, dude, yeah. this is the most realistic thing that we've, we've ever seen. So well, how many video movie, games you know, after that? We're just like, okay, the whole game is going to be basically the D-Day scene from Saving Private Ryan. Like, yep. it was like, that that had a cultural impact that I think is hard to even understand in the modern world where, like, everyone doesn't go see the same movie on the same weekend. You, everyone's consuming it at a different time. There's very few, like, yeah, totally different than when it was, like, everyone experiences at the same time. Everyone's grandpa told them it was crazy. Like, very and now, different. And now you understand I mean, what they meant. For sure. I mean, would, would we have ever played Beachhead at Dave & Buster's if it wasn't for Second Driver Ryan? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> that, game, that probably wouldn't have even been a game. Yeah, it was great. Game slapped, and to answer your way. question, Andy, I had a very similar experience my first time watching it. I think I was about 12. It came on unedited on TV, and my dad also sat me down and was like, hey, you need to watch this just to understand what like some people have done for, for your country. And me, yeah. Yeah, kids like me and you who always like, from an early age, military history and stuff, I really think that was an interesting... You know, we read books about, uh, you know, Caesar and different wars and campaigns and stuff. And we would just always, we had, we definitely had romantic ideas about it. And then you see Saving Private Ryan, it's like getting slapped in the face. We're just yeah. like, dude, you would never in a million years want to find yourself in this scenario. Oh, yeah. Like, up until that point, I really do, I probably did tell people like, yeah, I want to go be in the army or something. And I think that 
you just don't understand. Like mm -hmm. you just can't, and, and you know what? No child should know the horror of war. Like it's good sure. that we were raised in a place where like that was far away, but yeah, it, that's, that is why I, I'm glad that both of our fathers sat us down and were like, Hey, like you, I, I'm glad you're not going to be at on Omaha, but you should at least have a good understanding of what was done there so that you don't have to be on Omaha. <laughs> like, right. Good choice, Sam. So a Andy, what do you have for your, uh, for your second pick? Oh, so I think like second and third picks really. Oh, my back to back. Oh, nice. Your back to back. Okay. Like Drake. Then I am going to go, uh, I'm going to go with a comedy first in office space. So Ooh, I hadn't even thought about Ooh. that. Office Space. I, yeah, it was not on my list. This is near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is filmed in Austin, about a yep. mile from my first apartment that I had here at Metro. Where, where in Austin was it filmed? Because it seems like it's like super Metro, um, like Metro it Boulevard, like, like about ten blocks south of, or like five blocks south of Palmer Lane. So like North Austin. But this was back when it was that was yeah, like nothing. Yeah, land. so it's just like office parks right. and bullshit. Where Dell was like. The, the only right. company in Austin worth the shit was Dell. So, um, but, you know, Mike Judge still lives here. Uh, you see him around town all the time. Very much a staple of the Austin scene. He's great. And I loved this movie the very first time I saw it. But now that I've spent my entire professional career in, like, a technology company and uh, in a cubicle-like environment, like, this movie has become, like, both better and worse because it's so accurate. Um I think it's one of, like, maybe the greatest, like, commentaries on American life in a given period ever made. I Obviously, like, I think it's more about, like, our parents' generation of work than ours. Like, ours is a little bit different than this was because this was more about the dot-com boom. Like, and the commentary on that is so great. Like, they work at this company called, uh, like, Intercom or something or Intertrode or something. And yeah. their whole job is to prep bank software for the – y2k switch oh so yeah like going through lines of code switching so it from great. two to four digits which is like the most 1999 job yeah. you could have um but it's it's incredible all the characters have depth to them they each have their own like uh kind of motivation for participating in this like grift that they're going to try to pull off um they live like the quintessential like upper middle class white man's tortured existence where it's like yeah. you don't really have problems but you feel very like oppressed by the the like gray in like the gray life that you've fallen into where yeah. you're just going to do this for 40 years um and especially in the late 90s man i think that was a very real thing like even, it is today too but like these were you know the the generation before us had really been sold on the idea of like you know you're gonna be you're gonna be moving up your parents were kind of middle class you're gonna be upper middle class so like this is gonna be great and then they realized what that entailed and it was this cubicle life that emerged in the late 80s early 90s of the corporate of corporate America and it was horrific for their mental health and so this movie has so many I mean the the writing of the screenplay where they like you juxtaposition from them like in this office to like out immediately out into the field with the fax machine that jams every day and it's playing all the, the, the really hardcore rap music and they're just beating the shit out of the fax machine with baseball bats and like kicking it incredible um one of the early appearances of jennifer aniston as the uh the waitress at tchotchkes the, yeah. the, all the flair where yeah. they have to wear flair and you kind of get her you kind of get her like personal hell too it's like anyone that works in the service industry has worked with both a shitty boss who makes you do like extra shit like that and then also the co-worker who's like way more into this than anyone should be like she has that co-worker that's like the most fired up waiter who's like welcome to chosky's guys you guys can i start you guys off with some fajita poppers or maybe some extreme fajitas and they're just like oh god dude stop what <laughs> like man so yeah to kind of to piggyback Incredible. off one of the things you said there's definitely a reoccurring theme especially at the end of the 90s between like 1997 and 1999 where you get movies like office space or like american beauty or even like the beginning Fight Club. of the matrix where yeah it's like dude if you you know don't have a job at all you you feel hopeless and that's a huge problem but if you have a job then you've got the luxury of being like man i'm not doing enough with my life and there was kind of that not fulfilled yeah. late 90s like investment was booming like the economy was good and yet so many people i i think there was obviously that common sentiment uh because yeah it, it, i think it, people it figured out that like material having material things doesn't make you happy 
And that realization was really horrible because like you've been conditioned your whole life to like, Hey, just like, if you get this job and you get, you go to college, you get this job, you make this money, you're going to be good. And they did all that. And they were like, shit, I'm miserable. How do I fix that? So he's going to a hypnotist. Like he's doing weird shit to try to fix that problem. Um, and fight clubs, a very similar thing. You know, he's got like the, the accounting job or the insurance job or whatever. And he's in the same boat where he's like, I just want to feel alive and I don't right now. And so he gets into some crazy shit. So yeah, man, Office Space is an incredible film. I got to watch the, this at the Alamo Ritz downtown. It was the 20th year anniversary screening with Mike Judge and the entire cast doing a Q&A. And they sat in the row in front of me. I was right behind Samir and the guy that played <laughs> Samir and the guy that with the glasses that like does the coding for the scam. And I got to listen to them whisper to each other through the whole movie. So I got like kind of like That's this so like bootleg commentary where they were like, Dude, how many times did you have to try to do that break dancing move? Like a hundred. And I was like, ah, that's awesome. So, uh, incredible. Did you do text in messages like Top Gun? Dude, that'd be, that would have been a disaster. Did, that movie also answered idea. one of the, like, uh, you know, biggest questions of all time, which was, what would you do with a million dollars? Oh, yeah. Two chicks at one time, time, man. Yeah. Two chicks at one time. That's, 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 yeah, man, I figure. If I had a million bucks, to ch the kind of girls would double up on a guy like me, they'd be into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> One of the most meta responses that I've seen to that question on, on whether it's like Reddit or message boards is like, if ever there's a question about what would you do with money or if this happened in your life and somebody will just post a picture of that man staring yeah. towards the camera on the couch. He's you know? such a great and character. So dude. you either know it or you don't, right? He's <laughs> And everyone, again, when you're in your early 20s and you have your first job and you live in like a low-end apartment, everyone has had like a weird neighbor who like does construction or something. That's yeah. like when you're still in like the blue collar level of, of living situation and like him banging on the wall, be like, Peter, man, turn on channel 17, dude. <laughs> and it's like a, it's like them doing a 2020 investigation on breast cancer. So they have, boobs on the tv or like, <laughs> like hey so man good. uh i might be going away to prison for a while he's like real serious he's like all right man we'll uh watch your cornhole man that's, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's his that's his advice <laughs> like uh, yeah so incredible what, what's your third what's your third movie andy my, I love my third movie oh this is so tough um i'm going with heat Ooh. starring al pacino and robbie zanero Shut up. This is yes. This movie that is, is you got your head all the way up. It. This movie is one fucking awesome, two absurd. Like the it entire is. thing is fucking crazy. It's ridiculous. From moment yeah. one, it is just adrenaline, dude. It never you never get comfortable watching this movie because every scene is either like uncomfortable from like a personal standpoint or just like adrenaline going full pump. The opening armored car robbery where they just like the dude makes one false move. They shoot one of them and then they're like, well, might as well not be any witnesses. And they just rock and roll on all these guys. And then Al Pacino comes in and he's doing the breakdown. And he's like, as soon as it escalated to a murder one beef, they said, hey, what the hell? Might as well not leave any witnesses. And they rock and roll on all these guys. And you're like, <laughs> OK, so Al Pacino's going to be doing the the cool jazzy dude, detective thing the whole nuts. movie. All right. I will tell you that it's Pete great. Is, it's Pete great is definitely one of the best of the movies. But I every time I watch that movie, I'm fully convinced that, like, that was the time period in Al Pacino's life where he was like, dude, this is going to be your Oscar moment. And he just over and he thought he was winning so an Oscar. Hard. <laughs> he thought he, he definitely thought he was winning an Oscar and two, he was really having to he was really like torn between like every person he had ever loved and cocaine. Yeah, that, dude, it seems like he's on cocaine he was, the entire He is yacked the entire yeah, he film, is like dude. Prime out of control. Uh, it's but, it's so nuts. Um but the the there's so many great performances and well written characters in this movie. Like Robert De Niro is like this uh -huh. consummate professional thief. Um, you know, the reason it's called heat is because the, his whole like mantra is like, never have anything in your life that you can't walk away from in five seconds flat. If you feel the heat around the corner and him and Pacino are like two men who have sacrificed everything to be the best at one side or the other of the crime coin. So like Al Pacino's on like marriage number three, because he's just like so devoted yep. to being a detective. Hey, the best problem you and... can give your protagonist is they're married to the job, baby. Like, die hard. You're just too oh, good exactly. at it. Dude, you're too committed, and your family suffers. Although, Al Pacino is, like, 
Al Pacino's like dating some super rich chick, so he lives in a mansion the whole movie, yeah. which is tight. De Niro lives in a cliffside so mansion. The they were absurdly wealthy. Right. Um, but he's awesome. And then Val Kilmer turns in a really strong, maybe one of the, the later stage strong performances of Val Kilmer's career. Dude, Val Kilmer is this was a like 90s, prime. Like, it, it, the, he is so this was, synonymous with the 90s for me. I love This I love is the Val. period of Val Kilmer's career where he did Tombstone and this back to back. And so he was just like, I'm in the zone. I can shoot from the logo. Yep. No one will fuck with me. He's doing Doc Holiday, and now he's doing this. He's the gamp the degenerate gambling addict who just like has to have another job because he has n they're they're stealing like ten million dollars at a time, and he's broke as fuck and like beating <laughs> his wife. It's crazy. There's also little B plots that are like tragic. Like the the their their buddy gets out of prison. He gets saddled with this horrible job as a fry cook, where the boss takes a half of his check as like a corrupt like piece of shit because of parole. And so when De Niro shows up and is like, "Hey, I need a wheel man," he like signs up. He gets smacked. And then, dude, this movie culminates in what I think is like this is the shootout that like defined all shootouts in movies for like the rest of time. Like. This shootout was yeah. so good that some real life dudes actually did this in LA. They watched this movie and then went and got machine guns and robbed a bank in North Hollywood. <laughs> like it's so nuts. Yeah. That's how good this was. Um, and they did not use like visual effects for that scene. They shot blanks in, in the middle of downtown Los Angeles. So it was like super loud. It feels very you watch real. Watch that movie now. Dude, the the audio of that scene is crazy. Yep. Like how loud it is compared to like when you watch other movies that have gunfire. It's terrifying how loud the gunfire is. Um, and it's great. This movie is, is fucking of, uh, awesome. Hell or High Water when he pulls out his assault yes. rifle at the end, how the sound immediately just kind of like something about that scene like really cranks it up to like 11. Yeah, they just want to give it gravitas. Yeah, you're just to, like, to, like how, is... how, how, how much the presence of that weapon escalates the action. And yep. so... That's exactly like this. This is, I think, the quintessential, like, action heist movie. And I think that when, you know, there was an old, uh, I can't remember if it was, like, Dane Cook or what, but he said, like, every every man has a, a fantasy where them and their friends are pulling off a heist and they're running down the street being like, <laughs> where's the fucking van? <laughs> where's the van? Yeah. But this is where that came from, and it's true as fuck. This movie slaps. It's incredible. I, I, I. This draft pick feels like there was some, again, to use a sports analogy, is like this receiver out of Cal had 1,900 receiving yards and 20 touchdowns, but they also had like seven of those plays where they dropped the ball right before the end zone. Oh, bro, and, you know, like, like, and like three G, and like three and GUIs. Like, this this, kid's, this right, kid's a mess. Exactly. This like, kid is, a, is trouble. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is he Deshaun wasn't Jackson. eligible for half this of his career. This is Deshaun career, Jackson. But dude. like, like he's gang yeah. affiliated. Like, yeah, this is, but. It's it is it's got such a, a crazy high level of acting talent. It's the first time that Pacino this is and De Niro, a Raiders pick. Yeah, <laughs> it's the first time De Niro and Pacino were on on screen together at the same time, and they end up in this like that's crazy, which is huge that is deal. crazy. The diner scene, the diner scene where they sit down across from each other, and they it's like you know what I am, I know what you are. Like hey, and De Niro just puts it to him. He's like, look, like I I only know how to do one thing, and that's take scores. And your job's to try to stop me. And that's how it is. But I'm going to let you know right now. I'm not going back to fucking prison. <laughs> like, he's just like, straight up, you got to kill me. That's what it is. You want to kill me right now? Do it. But you got to kill me. Meanwhile, the dude from the first job that, like, fucked up the first job is like a straight serial killer in the background of this movie the whole time. Like, killing prostitutes and stuff. It's crazy. This movie's nuts, but it's awesome. I watch it probably once a year. Um... Me and my wife are in the middle of building our first house right now, and in that house is a media room that has built-in surround sound. One of the first movies I'm going to watch when I have you know, a night to myself is I'm going to just like turn off all the lights, crank up the volume on the audio system, and just watch Heat like front to back, dude. It's going to yep. be rad. I'm going to move on to my third pick because, um, man, I'm looking at my big board right now, and it's interesting because we still have so many really good dramas that either one best screenplay – Best original screenplay, best adapted screenplay, or maybe finish runner-up. But there's just, there's a few movies that are not technically dramas. And again, I just kind of go back to like what's available on the board. Andy, I thought you did a good job of, of picking, you know, off space. Um, I'm going to move down on my board a little bit and pick what I consider to be the best mystery slash thriller of 
the 90s. And that is The Usual Suspects. So Ooh. good. I just yep. watched this I mean, day. That won so a Best good. Original Screenplay when it came out, I believe. Two things that, that stick out to me is when you're doing a mystery and you can if you can build a mystery where the answer to the mystery is relatively well spelled out, but also most people don't guess it before it's delivered to them, that's like the mark of a great mystery, right? Oh, yeah. And then the second thing is I give a lot of kudos to any story, whether it's a movie, especially a movie where there's only like a two-hour runtime. I would even include written books in that when, they're, when you can work with more, more uh, pages where you have that many characters, so many different personalities that are magnetic in their own ways that you want to know more about that character. You want to see that character more on screen time yeah. um, or you want to see that character more in pages. They have such a large cast in this movie and they have so many events that happen in this, in this story just to keep the ball rolling and to not have it feel like analysis paralysis or just be too much information all at once, I think is such a great mark of this film, right? And it really is, like, one of the best whodunits in any oh, genre. Yeah. Well, any, that, it any, feels like that's how they hide genre, but any media. a little bit, too, is that, like, every character has to have some weight to it, or else you'd realize very quickly who Kaiser Soze is. So, like, the fact that they all have, like, deep background, they're all getting screen time, they're all doing, like, really important, integral pieces of the plot, you're like, any of these guys could be Kaiser Soze. Like, and you have to, it has to be said... The fact that Kaiser Soze has become such a huge like piece of culture that like that that name is uttered as like to illustrate like a a, a mysterious unknown actor yeah. is I think uh, speaks to the cultural impact of this movie. Yeah, that entered the yeah. lexicon. So that's it. I mean, yeah, I mean, dude, this is just such a great mystery thriller, and again, it made it so high up on my on my draft board just based on genre that I I couldn't go I couldn't not pick it. It being left there, it was it was my number six overall, um, as far as like number six screenplay of yeah. the nineties. And again, it was my I, I think five or no four of my top six were dramas. So I uh, given that another I think like ten out of my first fifteen were, were dramas. So I figured I could wait a little bit longer for that. So Usual Suspects is my man. It's a three. damn shame that Kevin Spacey turned out to be a weirdo because yeah, the yeah, man can act his ass off, dude. Dude, he's really good. Ass off, dude. Yeah. Well, and he ruined, dude. Her, yeah, tell me ahead, this: Wes. at the end of that movie, you know the big, the big reveal. Um, yeah, is that he made all this stuff up, and really, he's been like yeah. looking over the police captain's head and like just reading shit that's on the bulletin board. And and that Kevin Spacey is in fact Kaiser Soze. Yes, yes. Um, I need to go back and rewatch it. I feel like if I had one knock against the movie, it's that like there's not um, any. I would be interested to go back and see like how much information they give the audience if they're able to give you anything subtly before the big reveal at the end. Because I feel like the last time I watched it, one of my takeaways was like, man, this movie's known for its great twist, but like it kind of just feels like at the end they're like, hey, he was reading the bulletin board the whole time, but you never like saw I, the bulletin I, board. I felt like I feel like it's it strikes a good balance because it's not like the sixth sense where it's an incredible twist the first time you watch it, and then the next time you watch it, you realize it's like they're really, really staring you in the face the whole time. And yeah. so you can never kind of appreciate it a second time. Um, usual suspects is great a, a hundred times. It's always really good. Um, but I do think that they there are subtle hints to the the fact that he is in fact more involved than he's letting on because they they pitch him as kind of this like you know handicapped woe yeah. is me I'm just kind of on the side but he's this incredible con man and so he's yeah they they do I I feel like they yeah. strike a good balance but valid call out web because I will say that one of my biggest I hate when stories have twists and Unearned you twists. feel like as the audience, like I didn't give, I didn't get a chance to guess that. Right. Yeah. That's how I felt about the, the first one that comes to mind only because it's recent was Knives Out was like that. Or like I there, there's been other Out. movies, obviously. I, and I enjoyed it too. But like there, there, there are stories where like the entire story pins around this, this twist. I love the show Sherlock, but Sherlock, oh, yeah. it, it's called Sherlock, right? Oh, yeah. The one with uh, Benedict Benny Cumberbatch, Irvin, yeah. Where there's Fire. episodes where you're like, no, I would have never guessed that. Yeah, right? yeah. So I, I get what you're saying. 